Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to walk a little bit because you, of course, chose, unlike your students, all of whom always sit in the front row, you decided to sit further back. So um, that's OK. Uh, we'll still draw you in. I will say, uh, before I start, um, Ken always yells at me for using very strange words um, in, in my talks. And so if you don't understand something I said, raise your hand. Don't, uh, you don't even have to ask a question. I'll see if you raise your hand. Maybe I'll stop and repeat. So I'll, I'll do, or I'll explain. I'll uh, say it a little bit differently. So feel free to uh, interject in that way. So I wanted to, um, to explain a little bit about our approach to Minerva. And I wanted you actually to walk along with me in the process of how we envisioned this new university. And I want to at first say things that we didn't rethink. And I think that's important, because a lot of times people look at Minerva and they say, oh, it's so different, it's so new. You, you guys had no constraints. You can do whatever you want. Um, you, you're, you're boundless. And that's actually not true. We forced ourselves to be bounded in the same way that you're bounded. Slightly different because we're an American university, you're a Korean university, but at least in the same way that any other American university is bounded. So Minerva is an accredited undergraduate and master's program. Minerva has 120 credit hours that are necessary to teach in order to graduate. 100% of our faculty have PhDs from top institutions all over the world. We have majors, minors, a general education. Every class that we teach has seat time. You have to meet at a certain time, Mondays and Wednesdays from 9 to 10.30, um, just like any other university. There is a GPA. There is A through F grades. There are uh, admissions processes. You get conferred a diploma. We uh, provide education in newfangled and exciting areas like natural science and arts and humanities and business and computational science and social science. So on the surface, and by the way, we teach students in a residential environment. They all live together. And they enter as traditionally aged first year students. So we don't, we're not uh, focused on adult learners or any other uh, kind of segments. The students are full time, they're not part time, and they graduate in four years. Two semesters a year, fall and spring. So far, I think I've described every university you've ever come across in the United States, and if not, for the rest of the world. And that's important because. We aren't trying to be disruptors for this segment. We're trying to be reformers. And when you try to reform a sector, you don't want to break the interface that the sector has with the rest of the world. The world is used to universities providing degrees. They're used to a certain amount of time that is associated with those degrees. They're used to having transferability of credit between institutions. They're used to having a certain a set of individuals that confer oversight of those institutions, both within the institution, the faculty, and outside the institution, the accreditor. And so we wanted to make sure that the solution that we would build on the surface would be identical to any other university, such that if a university were to have inspiration to reform, they could look at us and say, wait a second, we can do what they're doing. And it wouldn't be a difficult thing to adopt. So that's the grounding of the constraints that we uh, built for ourselves. Now, of course, Underneath that surface, everything about Minerva is different. And that's, in some ways, the process I'd like to walk you all through 
and to figure out how it is that we created Minerva as it is today from an initial kernel of an idea. Okay? And so to walk you back to that first concept, I want you to create, recreate it yourselves. And you're already in breakout groups, which is nice, Ken mentioned, so I'll take advantage of this. Um, though this is a very small breakout group, you may want to merge groups, but that's okay. You can have a small, small group conversation as well. So, what I would suggest is take the following prompt, the following exercise, and talk amongst yourselves for three or four minutes. And here's the prompt. Imagine not the undergraduates that you see in your day-to-day -day class, but imagine the very best of those students throughout the history of this institution, the people who became the leaders of the country in government, in business, in science, in academics, in journalism, in culture. Imagine that all of those individuals walk into your class on the first semester of their first year in school. And because you're the first professor that they encounter, they're going to follow whatever you say. They're going to listen to you and chart the next four years at this institution based on your recommendations. Now forget what the institution does. Forget how it's structured. Forget all of the buildings around you. Forget your colleagues. You have the future of this country in your hands. They all walked into your class. You can tell them what they should be doing for the next four years, after which they will make every consequential decision in this society, 100%. Your design will decide the fate of Korea. With that light task in mind, I want you to talk in a group in your table and think about factors, skills, tools that you want them to graduate from your institution, the institution that you will now be designing four years from now. Okay? It could be one thing, it could be 20. How many of you can fit in three to four minutes and build consensus just among your small group? What are the characteristics that you want to see with the people who will run this country? Is that sound clear? One of you should take notes, and you can have three or four minutes to talk through it. All right, let's, let's try to wrap up. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do is, for whoever took the notes in your table, if there's a one particular trait or two or three that you want to share with everybody else, just say it out loud, or if you'd like to do it in Korean, Someone will translate. Anybody? Go ahead. We have tech literacy. Tech literacy. So ability, to ability to communicate well with others. Right. Now you have a microphone after you're done. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Other, other ideas. So tech literacy, ability to communicate well with others. Yes. Yeah. Just a little bit louder, or we'll give you a mic. Yeah, right over here. Um, first one is design thinking. Design thinking. Patience. Patience. And morality. Morality. Great moral framework. Good. Tech literacy, effective communications, design thinking, morality, patience. I love that. You don't hear that often. Very important. What else? 
Go ahead. Humanity and integrity. Oh, these are great. And these are going to be your future leaders. Right? That's, those are important features. What else? How about the table here? Leadership skills. They're going to be leaders. That's pretty important. What's a characteristic that you guys had? Sympathizer, have empathy. Absolutely, very good. What about you guys? Communication skills. Ah, so actually having cross-disciplinary communication skills. That's very good. How about you guys? Volunteering, the spirit of giving back. Great. You guys are going to try to hide, but I'm still going to call on you. Entrepreneurship, right? Being having an entrepreneurial mindset. How about you guys? Problem solving. Leaders are going to face problems. They're going to have to figure out a way to solve them. And what would you guys want to add here at the front table? Pressure is on. Uh, we have a long list. <laughs> Ethics, um, transparency, transparency. Uh, flexibility, mm -hmm. and uh, creative thinking, openness to a different culture, communication skills, problem solving skills, and um, this is one interesting thing, sound body. Sound body, yeah. <laughs> Problem formulation skills, and logics and analytical skills, mm -hmm. tolerance for diversity, responsibility, collaboration skills. Wow, fantastic. What a great list. And a great list collectively. I mean, really some things I've actually never heard a group uh, come up with before. I think it's all excellent. Have you noticed that there is something missing? A category of things that wasn't mentioned by anybody. Let me give you a hint. It involves 100% of what you teach your students. Disciplines, information, absent from all of your work. Kind of fascinating. That the thing that institutions do is never the top of mind for when you actually think about the outcomes you want for your students. Now, what's fascinating about this to me is that I, when I came up with this list myself years ago, I did add one more thing, which I thought was really important, which, funny enough to me, almost never gets mentioned. I think in, I've done these types of exercises many times. I think I've heard it once. But that's expertise. I believe that when you are in a position of leadership, you need to be expert at something. Not because you will necessarily be doing that thing, but such that you can recognize an expert when you approach them. When you have gone through the process of getting to a depth of expertise, it's much easier for you, given all of the other tools you talked about, to be able to suss out whether or not somebody else is an expert or kind of a creative artist uh, of, of truth telling. But you do need more than just expertise to be able to tell that, right? Expert scientists are not necessarily good at understanding who an expert humanist is, right? Expert uh, engineers are not necessarily good at knowing who an expert psychologist is, and so forth and so on. Because those other tools are what underpin your ability to analyze other things. And so now, as you're thinking about this amazing responsibility you have to train these individuals, which again, for you, is not a theoretical exercise. You do this every year. 
Every year you have students coming into this institution that will eventually shape this country's future. And so as you now think about designing their experience, the first question is, how do you build all of this stuff? Because what's fascinating is that if you actually look at, I am sure, even though I don't read Korean, I'm sure some of your marketing materials to students, certainly the marketing materials of almost every university in the world, mention some of these things, right? They'll mention, oh, we teach you how to think critically or solve problems, communicate effectively, etc. But the reality, of course, is that institutions believe that this comes as a byproduct of what it is that they teach. Unfortunately, the scientific evidence demonstrates that it does not. And so here, we have to provide some information. Well, I have to provide some information because as you need to design this type of experience, this type of education for your students, you have to take into account some of the things that we know about how the brain works. Now, why is it that if you were to teach a subject matter course of study, the natural outcome of that is not a, a, uh, a skill-based tool set? Okay? I'll give you the example that I've been using recently, which I think is the most crystal clear. So imagine that you don't feel well, you feel ill and you were to go to a doctor. Now, let's say the doctor looks at you and says, oh, you don't feel well. Here, take this medicine, and after you swallow it, tell me what's wrong with you. How many here would take the medicine? Good, thank goodness, none of you, <laughs> because you should never take medication from a doctor before the doctor knows what it is that you have. Obviously, no doctor would ever do that. It's malpractice, it's silly, it doesn't make any sense. In fact, every doctor in the world knows you diagnose the illness before you prescribe the, medita the medication. That's crystal clear. Doctors, in fact, ask diagnostic questions dozens of times a day, every day of their entire careers. If you cannot be an expert at diagnosis, I don't, you know, by doing that, I don't know what you can do, right, as far as repetition of task. So, plenty of it. So now imagine it's a long day, doctor kind of tired, goes home, starts an argument with her husband or he starts an argument with her. They fight. How many of these doctors, this, either this one that we're thinking about or any of her colleagues, how many of doctors would say in that situation, hold on, let's not fight. Let's understand the friction in our relationship that is generating this disagreement and address the root cause of that friction. Do you know any medical professionals that would treat an argument with a spouse in that way? Maybe one, maybe two, certainly not common. But why not? Why would a doctor that is an expert at diagnostics not be able to diagnose that the origin of a disagreement isn't the object of the disagreement itself, but something deeper. Why address a symptom when you can address the root cause? Because the doctor doesn't know diagnostics. The doctor understands how to diagnose an illness. One context. But the doctor has not learned how to understand the core problem in anything that she encounters in life. And so when the doctor is asked, do you support a certain legislation? 
the doctor won't necessarily say, wait a second, is it addressing the symptom that a problem generates or the root cause of that problem? If a doctor is asked whether or not a certain improvement needs to be made for a home, she may not think about, is the improvement just covering up a core problem with the house or is it at its heart structural and will fix this problem from recurring? doesn't have that natural instinct. This is ultimately what all of those things you talked about do. All of the aspects that you described are not within a discipline. They're cross-disciplinary. You expect your students to learn how to apply these tools no matter what they encounter in life. When you want to teach them how to think through design thinking, you don't want to teach them how to think through design thinking in politics because if they don't become politicians or if they become politicians and then go into business or vice versa, they need to be able to transfer those skills from one place to another. And transfer the holy grail of education cannot be achieved by teaching within discipline. And this research is, goes back now a couple of decades. It was famously done initially on air traffic controllers. Air traffic controllers back before things were very computerized had to exhibit tremendous critical thinking skills on the fly, right? They would have to think through all sorts of conditions, wind conditions changing, human error, um, unplanned flights coming in. And they would have to constantly think on their feet and be able to react with creative solutions to solve problems. And so a researcher at Harvard decided that they would be a great set of people to test how great they think critically and how they got there. And so as a baseline, he gave them a generic critical thinking assessment. And it turns out they did no better than the average professional. Zero transference. The doctor example is another example. No transference. And so the reason for that is that the educational structure within discipline doesn't connect for the student connections that are not naturally occurring in their mind. But you can create connections for students in this way. We just did one. Rather than choosing to teach a doctor how to diagnose an illness, choose to teach all students that before they address a problem, before they try to solve it, figure out what the right problem to solve is. This is what we at Minerva call hashtag right problem. And then, if you teach them using the context of medicine and of business and of interpersonal conflict, now, if somebody tells them you should vote for this legislation, immediately they'll say, is this addressing the right problem? That's the ability to transfer. And so whatever you decide collectively is required to teach students so that when they graduate, they'll be ready to tackle these problems. You have now an approach on providing them an education and a tool set that they can apply to anything. And by the way, as they progress through their curriculum, learning various aspects, could be their major, could be an elective, could be a minor, they can bring to bear these tools and demonstrate them when approaching that subject matter. 
And the nature of the classes, the upper level classes that you teach, will start to change. All of a sudden, students will think about the human aspects of business because they've been given a transferable framework to think through that. They'll interrogate various ethical perspectives in science because they've been given a framework to do that. And so forth and so on. That's what we call cross-contextual scaffolding. And cross-contextual scaffolding was at the heart of my process of building Minerva. It was the first thing that I realized was lacking in the world of education because I went through the exact same exercise you went through. What do universities owe to society? Uh-oh, not what they currently teach. That was, that was the beginning of this whole journey 26 years ago. Now we have a second problem. Imagine that you go through and you design the most wonderful curriculum you can imagine. You create a common intellectual language. You right level the concepts. Critical thinking, too high level. Why? Because critical thinking has many, many, many components. You have to learn how to evaluate claims. You have to learn how to understand inferences, make decision trade-offs, et cetera. All of those components have subcomponents themselves. Evaluating claims can be taking the shape of doing statistical analysis. It can be taking the shape of using logic or reasoning. Right? And then, of course, those components, if you want to go really specific, have even more subcomponents, but then you simply run out of room. But my guess is that if you were to do this exercise for more than three or four minutes, and it doesn't take much longer, by the way, you'd start to develop a very robust list. Right? And you'd start breaking things out, like so communication skills. All of a sudden, you'll start to think about it. Wait a second. There's so many aspects of communication skills. Understanding word choice, argument structure, understanding who your audience is as you communicate to them. Right? Understanding influence, cognitive biases. And so you build a large list. Now you come up with a dilemma. Let's say there are 40, 50 items on this list. How do you make sure that there is enough room in the curriculum to both introduce these subjects, a rather tractable problem, but also enough time to repeat them and follow and measure student progress along each one of these areas. Even though we talked about right problem today, I unfortunately can guarantee all of you that you will leave this room, and despite having this potentially in your mind, you will still not master right problem. I've been talking about right problem for my entire adult life. I'm still terrible at it. It takes time. Of course, I don't have a Minerva education, so that's probably one of the major reasons. <laughs> and so the, the difficulty is you actually have to start thinking not just about the design of a course, but a design of a curriculum across courses. Because you're going to have to introduce certain habits of mind or foundational concepts. These are the types of learning objectives that you all described. In certain courses, you may have to repeat them in those courses, but then they have to show up in other courses to reinforce until they begin the cementing process in the brain, until students can naturally apply them in upper-level courses without prompting. And so that's kind of problem number one. And it's a problem because the way that universities are structured really is on a course-by-course -course basis. And you all know this if you've ever taught a 102 level course, right? Because if you've taught a 102 level course and you relied 
on the students coming in, having learned what happened in the one-on-one level course, you have a great level of pessimism at the beginning of your semester. And you will somehow feel compelled to do a quick refresher. And by quick refresher, it means teach the entire 101 level course in the first three weeks of your course, because you will have no confidence that they actually learned what happened in the 101 level course. Now, this is a bizarre phenomenon in higher education, but it's the reality when education is delivered and designed by individual agents, not very collaboratively. When there is a common intellectual language, part of that problem is addressed. But there is a second part that is much harder, and that is the style of teaching. Okay. So here's a little bit more about the science of the way the brain works. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with active versus passive learning and the data around it. So for some of you, this may, may be old and boring. For others of you, it may be new and horrifying. But this research also started heavily about 20, 25 years ago, fully replicated uh, in many environments, um, showed some pretty stark uh, examples. A, it started actually with a professor uh, of physics at Harvard called Eric Mazur, who was given all sorts of teaching awards. He's a very charming guy, he's a great physics professor. Um, everybody loved him. And he decided on a whim to go and test his students uh, six months after the end of their semester. So he gave them the same quality test, meaning obviously different questions, but the same level of difficulty. Six months after his, his uh, physics 101 class for non-physics majors, right? So these are people who took physics and then were biology majors or uh, chemistry majors and things like that. It turns out that six months after the end of his course, which was a traditional lecture and test-based class, the students recalled 10% of what they knew during the final six months earlier. 10%. He was horrified by this, went back, redesigned his entire lesson, stopped lecturing. Did breakout groups just like this, everybody sitting in, in tables. He told everybody to do the reading at home, come into class, and he gave them homework in class. It was what we refer to as semi-active learning, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to later. And then he tested the students again. Six months later, he didn't really believe the results. He tested them two years after the end of the course. And two years after the end of the course, they retained 70% of what they learned. 70%. Now, let me put this in perspective because it's somewhat hard to wrap your head around it. Remember the time when you weren't feeling well and you went to that doctor? If that doctor if you had a bacterial infection, food poisoning, what have you, and that doctor would give you a sugar pill, it would be 30 to 40% effective. If she gave you antibiotics, it would be about 90% effective. Which means that active versus passive learning, using the same professor, the same material, and the same quality students, has a bigger efficacy delta than penicillin compared to a sugar pill. Substantially bigger. That's a real problem. And clearly, given the things that you chose that you want your graduates to know, this is not a nice to have. This isn't something that they could learn well enough for a final and then forget. Right? Because if they forget this stuff, what happens to society here in Korea? Not good things. And so once you commit to a level of education 
that shows the responsibility that these students are eventually going to have in society, you have to make sure that they learn. Right? You've got to make sure that they're engaged in their education and that they're doing deep processing in everything that they do. Now, fully active learning, the technique that we developed in order to enable this type of deep processing and long-term retention, ensures that everybody in class, for the vast majority of class time, is actually thinking through what it is that they're learning. Now, how does this work? One thing that our professors do is ensure that in small classes, at least, all students have roughly the same amount of time in which they talk during class. That's facilitated by the fact that professors barely talk in class at, by design. Second thing is that we assign both homework and the reading for out of class. And the in-class activities are novel applications. And third, we ensure that the activities during class are fully active, which means that even when a professor calls on a student, we ensure that all of the other students are still actively engaged in the material. Let me give you an example as to how to do that. Imagine this is a large class, right? We've got, you no, know, 30-some people in here. Imagine that every table was a group, just like you were earlier on. And I were to assign everyone at a table a particular grade based on the answer given by one of the members of your table. Oh. <laughs> And now imagine that I would grade you in the following way. I'd ask a question, and I'd ask the table back there to start answering. One representative of that table. Halfway through, I'd cut that person off and ask someone at this table, at random, to complete the answer. Then I'd ask somebody at this table to rebut that answer, cut halfway through, go back to that table and ask them to finish the rebuttal to their own answer, and then go to a fifth table and ask them to defend or refute that last argument. Now there is two, three, four, five, seven, nine tables here or so. The likelihood that in that exercise you would be called on and then be graded on is extraordinarily high. So number one, you're going to make damn sure that everyone at your table is fully prepared you have to because your grade can be dependent on the weakest link on your table and you don't like that. Second, once somebody is starting to talk, everyone at your table is doing deep processing. Oh my God, how am I gonna finish that argument? What am I gonna complete? And how am I gonna rebut it? Because that could be coming next too. And so you are all thinking deeply about what happens. That's fully active learning. Also intense. Are you guys getting a little nervous just by me describing it? <laughs> but it's effective. Now the last component, if I were to do all of this thing, the, the inherent value here is that I'm grading it. So what I would need to do is I would need See that camera there in the back? Because it's being recorded. I have to actually go back and listen to the recording because God knows I can't manage class and grade at the same time. That's impossible. Then I'd have to, from that camera, figure out who said what. Give, remember who was at the table. I have to give them all the same grade. And then bounce around and I'd make a ton of mistakes. By the way, to try to do fully active learning, figure out how everybody has the same amount of talk time? How do I do that? By the way, to introduce certain learning objectives in one class and then have 
good enough repetition and feedback on those and then have them carry over to other classes and track student progress over time? How do I do that? And this is where I realized in the building of Minerva that providing this kind of education cannot be done in this kind of format. It's impossible. You have to create a learning environment that is within the world of data, where when somebody talks, the system can keep track of who's talking how much, and then gives a professor simple prompts, like turning a video of a student green saying, call on this one. The professor can decide to call it or not, but it doesn't take cognitive load for them to manage the class. We're going into breakout groups as a press of a button, as opposed to figuring out, OK, everybody get up and move around. No, no, you guys have been in the same group before. And oh, don't do that, et cetera. Where everything is recorded such that when I go back, I don't have to guess who's in what group, who is the person that spoke, what they said. I can see it all. And where the assessments that I give to the students are using the same scaffolded framework that other professors are going to give to that student. So that a student can see the progress, both in depth of mastery of these habits or concepts, and in the breadth of applications, the contexts, so that we can provide formative feedback to these students before they go and run the world. So we can ensure that we educate them. So ultimately, this was the process to design Minerva. And lo and behold, when you actually design a university for these types of outcomes, the outcomes you get are extraordinary. So I'll give you some anecdotes just from our first graduating class. Now, I'll preface this by saying that in our first class, 106 graduating students, we made a lot of mistakes. The first time we'd ever taught a curriculum like this. In fact, if you look at what we teach our students now, it is unrecognizable from what the students that we were teaching four years ago. So radical difference. We admitted a bunch of students without knowing how to admit students. It worked, it did not work. We had on the job learning on all of these tools and the environment, the quality of the system that we were using, we were delivering classes from, was in its infancy when we started. And we had a whole bunch of operational hiccups and, and issues and things like that. So the class that graduated from Minerva this year is the worst class we will ever have, and by a mile. So what were the results of this less than perfect experience. So I'll give you some examples. In a class of 106, we had three students that decided to apply to postgraduate work at Harvard University. All three were accepted. One of them turned Harvard down to go pursue a PhD somewhere else. One of them was accepted into a two-year fellowship program that I think was reserved basically for postdocs. We had a student that didn't know whether or not he wanted to do a PhD in computer science uh, in the University of Chicago, he had a particular professor that he was kind of a fan of, or do an international relations master's at the Fletcher School. Uh, and so he decided to apply, and whoever would let him in, he would go to. He was accepted by both, and convinced both Chicago and the Fletcher School to allow him to matriculate simultaneously, even though they're in totally different cities. Um, we had another student who wasn't sure she wanted to do a PhD, um, and so decided to do, uh, apply for a theoretical physics master's program, was accepted by both Cambridge and the Perimeter Institute in Canada, which is perhaps the most important theoretical physics program in the world today. 
went to Cambridge. Well, should have gone a perimeter, but that's a different issue. And we had another student that was interested in doing physics, wound up doing a research internship at Caltech his freshman year and his sophomore year, did a, another research internship his third year with a Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist at Berkeley, which is, of course, where he went to get his, getting his PhD in physics today. And does that have a population of 106 students? And by the way, there's another person who's doing a computer science uh, PhD at, at, uh, at Boulder, another one at Georgia Tech. Pretty extraordinary outcomes. We had three students that, while they were students at Minerva, started their own companies and were funded externally, one of which won Y Combinator, which is the most important startup accelerator in Silicon Valley, the summer between his third and fourth year. Ran that company from Mexico, finished his degree, and graduated. Raised $5 million after that. We had a student who, uh, we had a, about six students that were interested in finance. Not one of them went to work for an investment bank. They all went to work either directly for hedge funds or to venture capital firms. One of them who was actually interning remotely with a venture capital firm for two years, or the last two years at Minerva, when they made her final offer or a formal offer to come full time, she was basically saying no. And so they made her a partner. I could go on. This is what happens when you take great talent, of which you have a lot here, and provide them a systematic education. This is what the research shows. Imagine if you shifted what you teach your students to what you know is crucial for them to be successful in life. Not compromising their expertise, but building on it. Imagine if you increase the efficacy of your courses by 7x at a minimum. Imagine if throughout the entire four years, you were giving students formative feedback beginning in their first week of school. And layer that on over and over and over again as they get through their four years. What would your graduates be able to do? And so this is our challenge to you. The challenge of rethinking, not the enterprise, not the surface, not the major, not the disciplines, but the process of grounding these students in an intellectual language you know that they need. And we hope we can be helpful with that process. So if you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them. Hi, Daniel Shen. I'm a PC and also teach here at Korea University. Um, by the way, Minerva School is doing great things for the world, so thanks for that. Uh, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll probably just try to just limit to one. Um, so, uh, you know, now New School, which is very progressive university, which also celebrated its 100th year this year, and they started probably with the same spirit what you guys do right now, and then now became more institutionalized in academic system based in New York. So in 50 years, 100 years, probably much longer than corporate life, you know, what you envision for a Minerva book school, and also the relation you have with the Claremont, and the how do you really leverage that into bringing to more formal education to the system? Great. Um, so <clears throat> two separate questions. So if you're not familiar, the new school that started in New York a long time ago Actually, a former president of the new school has been very closely associated with us. Um, started off as kind of a radical new uh, experiment in higher education and over time became much more traditional. Um, even though they still have some radical elements in their faculty, which is uh, just fun. 
But, and by the way, New School is not the only example. University of, UC Santa Cruz, another example. UC Santa Cruz had no departments when it started. They were anti-department. Guess how UC Santa Cruz is structured today? Everybody has departments. <laughs> They're the same departments as everybody else. So many of these early examples were, uh, uh, were institutions that started different and eventually succumbed to the natural incentives in the world of higher education. Minerva is, as you can probably tell, not unambitious. And so aware of these issues, when I started Minerva, I decided to change the incentive structure in higher education. That's a pretty bold thing, but I'll be clue you into my secret plan. It's not so secret. If you look at it, you look at the rankings of universities around the world, of which you are well aware, the rankings rank one thing and one thing only. It is the research output of an institution on a per capita basis. Right? That's, we all know this. It's, it's a fact, right? If you look at any of the rankings, it is how well much do you publish? And guess what is published correlated with? Money. Right? You have more money, you publish better. That's why rankings go up That's, you know, or versus down, especially if you have more money and fewer students. It's actually a, a lovely uh, formula. If you, you just, you know, uh, whittle your student body down and then in increase the amount of donations, you'll be the top university in the world you know, overnight. Um, don't tell your president that because that, they'll do it immediately. Um, and so the, uh, 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 so the incentive structure is all geared towards that output. However, luckily for us and our insidious plan, universities then decided to pull a coordinated hoax on the global population. And they said, by the way, human beings, the more research output a university produces, the better the educational outcomes are for our undergraduates. Why? In fact, it should be the exact opposite. If a university is spending all of its time and energy and research and efforts in achieving one goal, what will it by definition do? Neglect the other goal, right? And in fact, you could easily make the argument that the better PhD outcomes are related to research. That's, I think, a relatively logical thing. But to trickle down to undergraduate education, that's a, that's a logical stretch <laughs> by any means. And so, because in the popular imagination, educational outcomes equate to prestige, and prestige equates to research output, students and, and the population believes, aha, the more prestigious an institution, the better the educational outcomes are. Very simple. We like that because we are hijacking that. Remember, Minerva didn't have a single student five years and one month ago. Nine years ago, it was a figment of my imagination. Eight years ago, it was a figment of my imagination. I didn't have a single employee. And today, I am here speaking to you. I have the most selective and effective university in the history of the United States. How? Because of that insight. Because we hijacked this system. We focused like a laser on outcomes, and we generate our prestige from those outcomes. Now, I mentioned that what we did four years ago was terrible, and it was. It was still the best education in the world at the time, but we're embarrassed by it now. 50 years from now, I will be super embarrassed by what we're doing today, if I'm still alive. I hope I am. <laughs> Certainly 20 years from now. <laughs> I'm not going to sure how, how long I'm going to, this body will, will maintain me, but 20 years, I think, is a good, good bet. And so the, the, the way that we built Minerva is to create a self-referential improvement model where we constantly look back and 
up our game every year because that generates our prestige. And as we know, prestige in higher education is what many people covet, right? This is the, the fuel of this sector. And by the way, that prestige then also affords us our ability to help reform other institutions and say, wait a second, you too. Imagine again, Korea University improving educational outcomes the way I described. Well, Seoul National says, oh, well, we're Seoul National. We'll just do whatever. We're going to crush them. Right? It, it'll be a completely different ball game when it comes to an undergraduate student deciding, where do I go? Right? And so this is the great opportunity right, that comes with the structure that currently exists. Now, as far as the, the Claremonts, um, we are incubated within the Keck Graduate Institute, uh, which is one of the seven Claremont colleges. They've been amazing hosts. Um, this year, we began the process of spinning out. It'll take about two to three years to spin out of KGI, so we'll still be the Minerva schools uh, at KGI for the next two to three years. But then the accreditor, hopefully, will anoint us Minerva University, and then we will be a standalone institution. Um, so being hosted within KGI has been great. It certainly helped in that very first year Right, when we kind of said, oh yeah, we're starting the world's best university, but we had no, you know, no background, no students, no, just hired our faculty initially. And so it really gave us the, um, the legitimacy, the, the accreditation, the bearings to start. Um, and we're forever thankful. So, yeah. And when we spin out, we have to find a different library. Because we, we, we do use the Claremont Library. That's, that's the one thing we use from that, so. <laughs> Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation of your school. I'm from the uh, Public Administration Public Policy in Korea University. Uh, I have to leave you only because that I take the, uh, my time. I have uh, two questions. One is that I respect your school philosophy and the, uh, some of the trend in the, in the world. So uh, for me, that the two options, one is that I have to send my school, my school, my student to your school. That's one option. Another option is that uh, our school or our university adopt your new system into the, this uh, program. Uh, in terms of those, the, uh, my judgment and my assessment of your program and how to adapt your, your uh, school philosophy and uh, any technical level of the, uh, some uh, skill into the current the Korea University. Yeah. Uh, Korea University doesn't have any uh, fully adapt your program and the system. For example, uh, one of the faculty here, middle the uh, Professor Park, uh, told me that the, the Minister of Education in Korea doesn't allow to the, uh, release the 100% of the uh, on-campus service uh, delivery system. And this is something, a uh, regulation by the government. So in terms of these situations, what kind of best option for the, our school and our program, and particularly the university level and the department level? I, I more like to see and to listen to you any department level rather than the university level. Uh, absolutely. So um, on the first option of sending students to our university, that's not highly advised because we only have 150 students a year. <laughs> so it's very hard to get in. Uh, so that's perhaps not as much of an option. And we didn't build Minerva to be a large university. We built it to be a prototype. We built it to, again, inspire reform. And so, um, but on the second, I would say two things. First and foremost, you would be stunned with what can be accomplished with six courses, right? You give us six courses of general education, which is, should be under your 20% threshold, and we will transform um, the, the educational outcomes of, of this institution, right? And so, and when I say you give us, we're not teaching it, you'll be teaching it. It's your, your professors, right? Um, uh, your students, but we will train your professors how to teach in the Minerva environment, right? And we'll, give you maybe default settings, a curriculum that we've designed for those six courses, but over time, we'd want you to modify it, right? Change it over time, make it your own, right? Um, uh, 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 even now, you know, our professors change lesson plans to make sure that 
uh, they experiment with different things, or they collaborate on new ideas, etc. So that's where I would start a baby step. The second thing I would do is I go to the Minister of Education and tell him, you know, a year and a half ago, you sent a letter to uh, every university in Korea saying that we should adopt Minerva's system, but you know that's illegal. Um, so if you want us to do this, it's time to update the law. Um, and and I, I have a feeling, like given the number of times the Ministry of Education in Korea is saying, why don't you be like Minerva, why don't you be like Minerva, I think they may be receptive to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for a very interesting and uh, fruitful uh, presentation. I think your philosophy of the um, Minerva, Minerva School is very attractive, but it's very difficult to start recruiting quality students at the beginning. Actually, in terms of the high school GPA or other traditional uh, measure of the uh, you know, students. I mean, you said it is very difficult to get into Minerva School, but um, at the beginning, I think it is very difficult. And the, you didn't produce at that time any, you know, measurable outcomes uh, which your graduate will show to the society or something. So, how did you make it successful to recruit the best quality students in your school? Well, Ken was part of that process. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's, it, we, we started, so Minerva has um, uh, one of our big advantages in, in how we design the institution. So we talk about transfer. And even though all of our general education occurs in San Francisco, right, that's when the students come, they all live in San Francisco. After their first year in San Francisco, the students live in six different countries and across the next three years, starting in Seoul. So their first four months are here in Seoul in their second year. Uh, so you have 150 Minervans that are very, actually quite close to here, um, in, north of the river in Seoul. And, um, and so well, the reason that we did that is because it, for, for transfer, right, it, one good form of transfer is transferring from discipline to discipline, as the students do as they go through the rest of their education. But another good form of transfer is transferring from culture to culture, right? And so if you live in seven different countries, and then you say, oh, let me see how right problem is done in San Francisco, then compare it to that to Seoul, then compare that to Hyderabad, which are the first three cities, all of a sudden you realize how little you understand right problem, right? And then you have to understand all these other contexts. So from an educational perspective, when we built our own institution, we said, oh, we want them to have this global rotation. The side effect of that was that when we first went out talking about Minerva, the, the students, the applicants, didn't hear anything about our new education and our critical thinking and all that. All they heard about was, I live in seven countries as an undergraduate. Where do I sign? <laughs> and, so, and so it was an accident. And again, it was actually, it, it wasn't a good thing for us in the long run because we had to when they showed up, we had to say, um, by the way, you do realize this is a really hard university and, and we're going to have to make you work hard and, and all the rest. And so it took us a couple of years to actually understand that we talked a lot about the curriculum, but that's not what they heard. But what they heard was seven countries, right? And so now we barely mention the fact that they go to seven countries and that's half of what they hear, right? Um, and so, which is fine. But it's a, um, a, a, but we really just almost exclusively talk about the curriculum and the difficulty and, and everything associated with it. And, and that, but the fact that we had that attraction because it was the only way to do that as an undergraduate drew a lot of demand. And that's, that's how we actually did it. It was in many ways, we didn't realize that that would be the attractive reason, but without that, we wouldn't have, I don't think we'd be able to have attracted that first class. I'd, I'd also add yeah. one or two things. Interesting, because I was out there, particularly in the early years, doing a lot of this and speaking with a lot of high school students. And I was pleasantly surprised um, at the, maybe not in terms of percentages, but absolute numbers globally, which includes in this country here, of high school students who are 
thinking very <coughs> deeply about what university should be for them, what university should mean, who are, dare I say, dissatisfied with a lot of the current offerings that actually exist out there. And so, uh, not that it was necessarily you know, easy, because we had to go out and get the word around, but uh, just as an example, even these, uh, this time in Korea, uh, this morning, earlier, yesterday, um, speaking at some other uh, institutions, and where there's, there may not be any students present today, where there were undergraduate, graduate students present, it's palpable to see and, and, and feel the interest in not only what we do, sometimes it's, it's initiated by the interest in something different, something new, something uh, that they, again, they get the sense that maybe something, some part of the traditional system could be, could be better, maybe it's a little bit broken over here, a little bit broken over there. There's a real desire and a demand for this. I would imagine couple this with, I mean, again, in the beginning, as you said, we did not have a reputation in the beginning. We do now, right? It's a lot easier now. This institution already has a reputation, such that if you did start doing something differently along these lines or whatever, um, you would already have, you know, that wouldn't even, that wouldn't be a fact. It would be made easier. And, and today, the vast majority of the students that come to Minerva come for curriculum first. For the right reason. That, but that took us a couple of years. You, you don't have any majors, right? Yeah, we do. No, we, we have, so again, on the surface, exactly like it. We major computational science, natural science, social science, arts and humanities, or business. But then, but, but then at the same time, but then at the same time, students can actually move around the different majors and... Yes, you they don't, don't have, have to... to we, it's, it's an American model, right, in the sense that you don't declare your major until your sophomore year. You don't declare your concentration until your junior year. Right, so it, it pushes it out later. Okay. I mean, I was, we have, we have students who wait until their fourth year to declare their concentration. Concentration is what most universities call majors. We, we call it concentrations. Do your students have to go out of, uh, out, you know, out of your system uh, by, you know, fourth year? I mean, after four years? No, or no. You, so they can stay longer and correct. then do, do more? Correct. Yeah, so, okay. the, for example, there, there are, I think, two members of the first class that will graduate this year that didn't graduate last year because they took a semester off, they took a year off, they did lay their capstone. I know you, you well, you mentioned about becoming a university, being called university. So you know, apparently that you want to stay as a uh, higher education institution. But at the same time, it is a business model. I mean, from, from educational service industry, it's a, a new business model in a way. Yeah. And you, you, you've got lots of uh, investment from, uh, from somebody. So as a company, yeah. if it is a company, then the you have to... university is not a company. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and you have, to, you have to actually return the, the invest, I mean, something yes. to the investors, right? Yes. Unless they don't ask anything and then gave you money. So uh, I, I see that there should be some kind of uh, business side of uh, yeah. what you do. But at the same time, you're doing it... Uh, uh, with the with the, in, within the educational system, right. uh, but still, you can. I don't think you. I mean, I, I I'm not sure whether it'll be viable for you to just ha continuously select only 150 students all from all over the world, and and then still say that we have a deep impact on 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 the higher right. education right. because uh, you don't have a size, right? right. And as the other faculty, as you know, as you then increase numbers and blah blah blah, and there might be something happening in between that. Oh no! So I'll explain. So let me explain the the because this is a great question, and luckily, our investors did have one of these traits, which is patience. Uh, so very, they're the most patient investors I've ever met in my life. Um, so let me describe a little bit about the structure. So. Minerva invested, or, or is, it, was a, is a corporation initially, um, that w had $130 million, $128 million of investment going into it. And what the corporation did was two things. It built the Minerva system, right? The curriculum, the pedagogy, the feedback system, the technology, the brand, et cetera. And it basically took the bulk of that $128 million and gave it away to charity. Um, and that charity <laughs> was the Minerva Schools at KGI, which is a separate nonprofit, right? And doesn't have any financial connection to Minerva now, before Minerva paid for everything, but as of July 1, now that we're getting the spinoff from KGI, it's now a standalone nonprofit and it, and it funds itself. It raises money for scholarships and, and things like that. Now, 
the university itself was designed to be that beacon, right? To, to get other universities around the world to look and say, we want to be like that. And in so doing, it has to create this compromise-free environment, right? And so part of it is the way, the crazy way we do admissions. Actually, you actually have it here on your piece of paper, which is, uh, which is fun, which is the first sentence. It says, if you qualify, you will be invited to attend. So we have a 100% admission rate, 100% for anybody who meets our criteria. And our criteria, fortunately for the world and unfortunately for the institution, um, do not have any correlation with wealth. And so our students are overwhelmingly poor, which means that for every incremental student that we bring in, we have to raise more scholarship funding. And that means that we don't want to grow. <laughs> In any case, it's more expensive than for us to have it. And so the undergraduate student body of about 600 students across the four classes will stay the same. We have a master's program that helps offset some of those costs. And once the master's program gets to be about 150 students, roughly 75 students a year, it's a two-year program, the institution breaks even. It's a nonprofit, so it doesn't need to make money. It just needs to break even. And so that's kind of the natural size of the institution. Now, the university will still... Uh, you know, continue to offer interesting new programs. For example, uh, we're, we're this year uh, experimenting with a, uh, an executive education class. It's not really executive, it's professional education uh, around communication for professionals, right? Which is a short course, much like we're teaching here in, in Korea. Or not we, but enabling. Um, and the university may offer that and may make some revenue from that, etc. But it's, it really is meant as that demonstration uh, uh, institution. So the university itself has no incentive to grow. It has every incentive to stay small. Uh, and our assumption is we'll continue to, to do that. So now, the corporation then, so meanwhile, so what, what now does the corporation do, right? Because how do we have broader impact? That is the corporation's job. The corporation's job, remember, it owns all the system. It owns the system, the intellectual property. The corporation's job is to go around the world and find like-minded institutions that want to reform and then enable them to do that. And so that way, the Minerva system can impact millions of students around the world and can do so in different ways. The sequence of courses that one institution will uh, adopt will be different than another. Other institutions will create their own courses, but all on the system. And so that's how we achieve scale. It's not through our, uh, this little nonprofit. That's what I thought. No, yeah. I, mean, I was just expecting yeah. that. Right. And if we do that, then our investors will eventually get a return. <laughs> take a long time. Okay, it'll take a long time. Yeah. Okay, one other question is, yeah. uh, well, I, I think at least uh, the people here are interested in what you have been doing. So that's why we are here. And probably some of the, the thoughts that we can share among our audience would be, uh, what KU can do? What can KU do? Well, let's say if we want to follow your footsteps, uh, what would be the way that we can do? Because we, we, we intake uh, uh, close to 3,800 students, a lot it from government, and then if you add extra students every year, it'll be close to 5,000. It's a huge university, actually. We have to maintain fixed assets. Uh, we've been very traditional, but you know, in the big, at the beginning you said that you are a reformer, but to me it sounds like you are destructing everything and actually building a new thing. I mean, there might be people who are thinking that way. So uh, you know, uh, but still, if some, you know, if if the school wants to still continue to innovate and change, uh, what would be your advice to an institution like? Uh, us in this size uh, and uh, how to start it. You know, well, it's, it can be a departmental quest level of question, <laughs> but I'm asking you to in terms of uh, at the university level. So at the university level, well, the departmental level, I think it could be relatively clear. You, you can institute us at the beginning of the, the course of study and all the rest. But at the institutional level, what I would do is obviously assuming there is the desire to reform, the desire to, uh, to change, what I would do is I would take perhaps a subsegment, maybe a four-core sequence, something light, and 
put all of the students through it. Maybe even put all the students through the first two courses in the first semester, and if they do well enough, let them go into the second semester. And so when you do something light, what you'll see, and this we've now seen this at another institution with a very different student population than Minerva or KU's, um, is you will all of a sudden see a level of engagement and excitement about their education that you may have not experienced in a long time. And that energy will enable the university to start rethinking things. So I'll give you an, an example. When we first launched with um, the University of Science and Technology in Hong Kong a year ago, tiny pilot, because it was the first university we'd ever worked with. We had no idea how to do any of these things. So we decided we'll do one institution small, right? Every other we'll do big, but one institution, we'll just see how it works. And UST raised their hand, and they said they were interested in doing it. And within two months, I was there in November of last year visiting. We started in September. And the head of the program, uh, the uh, UST Minerva Scholars Program, said, um, oh my god, we have to rethink how we do disciplinary education. For these 19 students, right? it was 19 students, but he says, they're getting these amazing tools. And, and he, the idea he came up with, which I think was actually brilliant, was to say, look, what we could do is for every one of the courses they take in their upper level years, we can ask them for a small credit, like half a credit or something like that, to write a paper showing how they use the tools they learn in the program in those courses. And we can use the system to continue to grade them and give them that index over time. So he came up with a way to do a scaffold without actually having to convert all of the other classes to Minerva classes, because of course it's impossible given that small population. And so the, the tools that you start getting, right, when you have this kind of system are amazing, right? And that will help reform the institution. Because remember, I mean, you can afford to have these buildings. We can't, but you can. There's nothing inherently wrong with, you know, a, a campus-based environment. It's just expensive. If you can afford that, great. Right? Um, and, and more power to you. We can make it a little bit more efficient, perhaps. Maybe enable you to teach 6,000 students as opposed to 5,000 right, per year, right? Um, uh, because we, we don't have that burden on the facilities. But the, there's really nothing about Minerva that it requires a particular physical uh, uh, configuration, right? So we, and when we instituted our, uh, our university, we decided oh, let's take advantage of th cities and have them travel and do things like that. You, by the way, can all of a sudden say, hey, you know what? Now we can actually teach all of our third year students when they go remote, when they go abroad. So let's send more of them abroad and continue their education from here, right? Because we'll have a system to be able to do that, right? So, so these types of things will pop up, but it all starts with the general education. So, if, if you wanted to start small, I would do a, a, a slimmed down version of the gen ed for the broader student population, and it'll all flow from there. Other questions? Um, thank you for the presentation. Oh, I have two questions. The first one is, how would you deal with the students like, who got like, low Can degree? You speak right into the mic. How do you deal with the students who got low degree? Even though the students are really qualified, there's, there's some of like, like students who got low degree, and then do you actually encourage them? Meaning low grades? Underperforming. Underperforming within Minerva. Yeah, we definitely, as I said, we definitely have students who, let's just say, do not take their education very seriously. So it depends how bad it is. Um, we take Fs very seriously and we issue them. We believe that if you're going to have this kinds of demands on students, do your homework, do your reading, come to class prepared, engage, you have to have a bit of a penalty, right? Where if you come to class and you're not prepared, you get asked to leave class. So at Minerva, we have a very strict attendance policy. We're 26 sessions in a given semester. Students can miss three of them. If they miss a session, they have to watch the recording of the class and write a short essay about it. 
So it's a penalty for missing class. They can't get, really get out of it. Right? If they miss a fourth class, they've dropped the course. Right? And so we have a very strict view on engagement. Now, because we are very highly selective, we are very demanding from a, um, from a, uh, a time and, and effort perspective. But Minerva courses are designed to make students successful. They're not, you know, when you think of a hard course in a typical university, think about like the, the hard course, you know, I'm sure there's like a physics course that is notorious at KU for, you know, people constantly flunking out of because it's so hard and so conceptually difficult. That's not, you won't find that kind of course at Minerva. We teach physics, but we teach it in a way that teaches students physics, right? And so we do it in such a way that if you spend the time and effort, and some students may require a little bit more time and effort, but if they spend it, they'll pass, right? But if they don't, we flunk them out. And so we work with students to make sure that they have every effort to pass, but ultimately, if they're lazy, it doesn't work with the system. And the second question is, um, how would you define the successful students? So successful students for our perspective, are students for whom the impact of their education is apparent as they get the education and compounding later. So when I describe the outcomes of our graduating students, I could have also told you about what they did their first year summer, which would be as impressive. Because what our students do after one year at Minerva, most third year Ivy League students don't do. Right? And so if, if we don't have impact that's demonstrable with our system, why would you be talking to us? <laughs> you know, it would make no sense for you to adopt any of it. And so we have to make sure that the tools that they're getting are ones that are apparent, that people can see and take advantage of. And then our long-term success will be that graduates of the Minerva programs, not just Minerva schools, but any program, any partner uses, are going to accelerate in their career at faster rates than others. Because again, if you have the characteristics that you described, you should be a more successful person, right? And, and that really is the whole point. Thank so. you. Well, I know the admission rate here, but uh, I wonder if you can tell us the two statistics. One is graduation rate, the other one is dropout rate. Yeah, so in our first class, which again, worst class ever, um, we had about 80% that graduated, and we had about 10%, uh, 10, 12% that we flunked out. And then the rest transferred, there was too much, too much chaos, et cetera. In, the other classes, we expect to have graduation rates of 85 to 90 percent, uh, with about seven, eight percent that we flunk out in a few transfers. Of course. Uh, you said that you, you, well, there's a graduate program, right? Okay, yeah. so undergrad, you're taking in somebody very fresh in a way. I mean, it's, yes. they are not framed. Versus graduate students, other one who who's, who went through the traditional educational right. system. So, uh, do you see the difference between two groups in terms of breaking them into your own way of uh, you know philosophy of education, right? And and how uh, is it possible for you to break someone's uh, thought process in yeah. two years and actually have the same performance compared to undergrad program? Yeah. So. I, so we've only had 13 students through our graduate programs. <laughs> so we have another class of 14 that started just this, this fall. So all I can tell you is really anecdotal, right? I mean, for, we have statistics listing of the undergraduate population. Anecdotally, we've seen students that have truly benefited from these frameworks, but 
I wouldn't call them as transformed as the undergraduates. I mean, just brain plasticity is lower, right? Um, and they also are doing uh, the, you know, they're, they're basically doing the habits and concepts and then a master's thesis and they're done. So they don't have two or three more years of study to keep marinating in it and, you know, and, and building on it. So, I mean, the impact of the 13 students that we have, the impact is clear. We hope that that will demonstrate statistical significance as we grow the class. So I, I can't claim to this. I'm, we're very um, evidence uh, um, uh, purists. Um, but our assumption is that the impact will be significant, but near, not nearly as significant as the undergraduate program. That's, um... yeah. uh, first of all, thank you very much for sharing your insight and experience. Um, could you describe an image or picture of your school in your expectation after 10 years from now? Sure. Um, so I think 10 years from now, um, I think there are a few things that are going to be slightly different about, uh, about what we do. So first, um, and this is kind of the fun, the fun part, you know, we, we've, we've gone now to the iteration level of our courses. And I think that three or four years from now, we're going to go through a major overhaul, right? So I, I think that the nature of, especially our upper level courses, our uh, uh, disciplinary courses, they're not radical enough. Uh, and I, I think that we're going to be much more radical in the future in the way we do cross-disciplinary education after the general education. Um, I think that um, we are going to know, because we're now doing research on transfer, there's, there's an enormous amount of literature that shows how transfer doesn't occur. There's almost no literature to show how transfer can occur. because <laughs> So it's actually really interesting. So we intend to generate that literature. And we believe that we're going to create a curriculum that will be fine-tuned to ensure that transferable skills are, uh, are generated. From a curricular perspective, I see our majors and concentrations becoming much more radical and much more cross-disciplinary. And I see this upper-level scaffold being built in a much more scientific way because it's one of the areas where it was mostly a shot in the dark in the way we initially put it because we knew what not to do. But exactly how to tune what, what we should do will take time. Um, I think from one of the, and it's a strange concern to have, is one of the concerns um, uh, we have, we constantly have, is I think that 10 years from now, we will have to change our admissions process monthly. Uh, because my guess is that the uh, people are going to, I mean, right now, our, I mean, we're, last year our acceptance rate was below 1.2%. This year, I'm worried that it'll maybe even break 1%. The, the, the demand for what we do is so large. And so far, we've been able to keep ahead of the people who tried to game the process. No one actually knows what the formula is. At some point, 10 years from now, machine learning and artificial intelligence will be set upon us and crack the uh, whatever static uh, equation. And so we're going to have to do. Um, uh, uh, admissions to Minerva in a much more radical way in order to ensure the equal access concept that we have for, that we have today in our uh, student body. So that would be probably the second, uh, second thing. And the third thing, which I'm almost, um, uh, which is one of my personal passion, 80% of our students are on financial aid, 80%. And a component of financial aid is um, work study. So we, we find them jobs, and they work, and they work for us. They work for external companies, et cetera. But within a few years, my goal is to make Minerva 100% work study. So not because of need, but because of requirements. Because right now, what happens is the 20% of students that are wealthy don't have to work. And then the 80% of students that are poor have to work, or poor middle class, et cetera, have to work. And so the poor students have to do more work being at Minerva than the rich students, and that's not OK with me. Um, I believe in work. I think it's important. And so I want to make sure that work is a requirement of the Minerva process. Everybody comes in. They all have to work. Um, it'll be part of the credit-bearing system, and they get paid. But um, so transforming Minerva into a working college is, I don't know how long it'll take, but in, certainly in the next 10 years. 
He didn't ask about that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm answering the question. I, I yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm from College of Education. So, uh, uh, anyway, thank you for your sharing about the Manaba. So, I think uh, as the president of the Manaba, I think uh, you have educational philosophy, obviously. So, I have two questions related to uh, uh, one is related to you know transferability, and the other is related to you know discipline. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of transferability. I think based on your experiences, you know, uh, what is your perspective on balancing, you know, depth and breadth of transferability? That's going to be an important issue mm -hmm. while you are developing any course. Uh, I, you know, uh, developed by myself, you know, creative character education, for instance, in mathematics. But I have some dilemma in that, you know, depth and breadth issue. Yep. Another, uh, the other question is related to discipline. So from my perspective, you obviously, as the president, you develop you know, the concrete discipline from my perspective. But I think in higher education, for in, in graduate school, you know, abstract discipline are also important. So I'm just wondering your perspective on balancing between two of them, abstract principle and concrete principles? That's my two questions. I'm not sure I could easily answer the second one. Uh, so uh, um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I believe I've gained a certain level of expertise in certainly institutional and curricular design. But, you know, it's, uh, maybe I'll address the second one as much as I can first. I, I don't think there's much wrong or right when comes to a disciplinary approach, right? I think that different individuals have different outcomes. I mean, look, if, if you want to be a theoretical physicist and publish for the rest of your life, there's a pretty good path in, in, how, to, in how to do that, right? And it, it, in, yes, I mean, of course, if you have a better general education, you'd be better at doing that. But ultimately, it doesn't necessarily need a lot of innovation, right? Whereas if you know, I mean, I, I, I argue, I mean, I went to Wharton as an undergraduate, I went to business school, and to this day, I am confounded by the fact, that we even have a business program, that I don't understand why there isn't a sales concentration. Mm -hmm. It's the most important aspect of business, by far, more important than anything else. I mean, you know, certainly marketing, finance, accounting, etc. No one teaches sales. I don't get it. I was committed that we would teach sales, that sales would be a concentration at Minerva, and I couldn't get, I mean, this is part of making our thing more radical, I couldn't get the academics designing the concentration to, to build a sales concentration and say, well, well, you know, we'll just infuse sales and everything. And that's how they convinced me to let go of this. But I was, you know, hopping mad, right? I was like, this is the most important thing. Why would we not do this? So, you know, but that's just my perspective, right? You know, and I, I don't really, you know, I'm no more qualified to, I mean, sales, maybe I'm a little bit more qualified than others to talk about. But, but you know, in other things, it's, it's I think there, there's, you know, it, 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 this is really the beauty of heterogeneous education. I mean, one of the things that is so important about, for us at, as Minerva, is that we don't spread a homogeneous education. We want every one of our partners to have a different flavor of general education that reflects their institutional values. One of the reasons I started by going through this exercise is I would love for KU to actually infuse humanity and patience in your general education. Oh my God, that would be so fantastic. Right? We don't have that. Right? And that's something you should build. It should be a differentiating point. Right? This is, this is really the, the, um, what we want to enable. Now, as far as depth versus breadth of transfer, they're highly related. And so we know, in fact, there's, there's a, so we have various formula, right? Because, it, so one of the things about the nervous system, which is nice, is professors assess and give this formative feedback throughout the semester. But the professor doesn't generate the grade. The system generates the grade, at least at our university. Because the 
professor grades the student all semester long, and then it goes through this giant formula, and then it determines, is that an A, an A minus, a B plus, or a B? It's not subjective, it's objective rubric-based grading. And so one of the ways in which we, um, we have to, we're working into a new formula is how much of the grade should be about depth of expertise and how much of it should be about transfer. So transfer exists for about 30 some percent of the GPA has a component of it that is transfer, right? So if you wanna get a 4.0 average, which is almost unheard of at Minerva, I think it is unheard of, um, you have to not only de demonstrate depth of experience, but you also have to demonstrate transfer and that counts for about 30 some percent of your, of your grades, about uh, 36 of the 120 credit hours are, are so exactly 30% uh, uh, of your GPA is as transfer as a component. And then what we do is we tweak what that transfer is. So for example, when you are uh, assessed on your application of an HD, a habit or concept, we use a five point rubric scale, right? Roughly, a three means that it is uh, uh, an effective application. A five is you know, a brilliant level of depth of insight. A one is you know nothing about this clearly. Um, and transfer is therefore um, uh, assessed based on what you get. So in order for you to get transfer credit, you have to get at least a three. Because otherwise, if you try to transfer a new context, but you're not using the tool, it's actually what we call false transfer. And false transfer actually reduces your transfer grade, right? Because you clearly don't understand how to apply it. And so the depth and breadth are related. And then you can get a, um, uh, a five in application, right? A really brilliant deep insight, but with no transfer, but in the context that's expected. That, however, is much, much more difficult. I mean, fives are almost impossible to get to begin with, but it's hard, very hard to get a five in a no transfer context than when you do far transfer, right? Because the nature of you far transferring means that you've achieved a certain depth of understanding that allows you to have some brilliant insight. And so you'll see that there's a very high correlation between depth of mastery and transferability, but it's a correlation once you get to transfer, because there's a lot of people who get depth but no transfer, right? And so, but it's very few people who get transfer without already achieving depth. And so then, I don't know if that answers the question. But the, and that's some of the research that we're going to be we're working on and, and we'll be publishing over the coming couple of years. Okay, well, I think we've uh, uh, spent a lot of time. Thank you so much for your engagement. If you have any questions I mentioned, there is a Minerva certified professor sitting amongst you, uh, uh, right, right there, uh, who has been delivering a, a Minerva uh, executive education program to an unknown company uh, uh, here in Korea, unknown because we've not announced the relationship. But, uh, but if you want to know what it's like to teach on the Minerva platform, granted, not undergraduates, not even master students, uh, in a very different format, you can ask, ask questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.